Feast of Mamre, while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby when he fell low to the ground. He said, If I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so that you can be refreshed and then go on your way now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered. Do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three seahs of fine flour and knead it and bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. While they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Where is your wife Sarah? They asked him. There in the tent, he said. Then the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already old and well advanced in years, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out and my master is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, Yes, you did laugh. I want Columbia Christian to succeed and thrive. And after what Brother Gardner has said tonight, uh, I really don't intend to do any more speech making about giving. I just want to let you know that from my perspective, from a long way away in Middle Tennessee, I see the need for this school being here I see the fruit of the good that you have done over the years, and I would feel a tragic sense of loss to God's kingdom agenda for his people if, if you should not rise up and be his hands and feet to make possible its preservation. Two weeks ago today, I was having dinner with two people who have been very much influenced by this school, by this church, by this community. Mark and Christine Parker, I was in Zagreb. I delivered either five or six, I forget, it, it's a blur for the last two or three weeks, either five or six lectures to various groups from the Croatian Medical Association. I was there with Joy Crouch, someone from your part of the world, loved and respected and, and supported by some of you. And we talked even there about Columbia Christian. And we talked over dinner that night about um, the situation here and how important it was that you thrive. But in order for you to thrive, you must get through this latest in a series of crises. And, and I know it is not the first, but you must get through this one in order to have the future that God wants to give you. Very often, faith gets tested in a variety of ways, and one of the ways that God tests our faith in Him, one of the ways God tests 
our willingness to be used by him, one of the ways God tests our desire to be involved in his plans in this world is by letting us face periods of scarcity, times of difficulty, and what you have gone through has been a test. I don't know if God will raise up a good Baptist for you or a good evangelical from across the river who loves the Lord and wants to share out of his largesse with you. I suspect we have to look first within our own numbers and our own fellowship and take that as a serendipity if it comes about. So I encourage you to do what you can to keep this dream alive. And while he's asked you, I, I'll give you something. If you're here tonight, if you haven't gotten a copy of the magazine Wineskins, there are some here and many more in the back. Mike Cope and I edit that magazine. And we already have a very wide readership out on the West Coast, and we would like to number you in that group, and I encourage you to pick up a copy. That's free. Any donation that you might have left for the copy you're picking up, just earmark that for the school and let it stay here. It's interesting to study what makes people laugh. Sometimes it's a revealing bit of research. Sometimes it even contains spiritual insight. Most of our attempts at humor are rather innocuous. They are not particularly deep. They are not particularly revealing in and of themselves. Take those light bulb jokes that were told years ago. I think they probably started back in the 60s. As I remember them, they started as, as jokes about Polish people. But hey, if you're Polish, don't be offended. We've all now gotten our share at being the targets of the light bulb jokes. If you're from whatever state, if you're a graduate of whatever school, if you're a member of, you know, whatever club, everybody's had his chance now to be the victim of the light bulb jokes. How many New Yorkers does it take to change a light bulb? Three. One to screw it in and two to criticize him. <laughs> How many Californians it take to change a light bulb? It takes ten Californians. One to screw the bulb in and nine to share the experience. <laughs> How many psychiatrists it take to change light bulb? Really only takes one, but that light bulb really has to want to change, you know. <laughs> How many preachers it takes to change light bulb? Only one, but he'll thunder, let there be light on the last flick of the wrist, and then he'll hope there's a lot of folks around, and when the light comes on, he'll pass a hat and take up a collection. <laughs> Most of our jokes are, are just about that deep, just about that important. And you change the label, and you make somebody else the butt or the target of the joke, and it's all in good humor. Ethnic jokes, though, are not innocent, and they serve to promote stereotypes and prejudice, and so the English joke about the Irish, whites about blacks, blacks about whites, sexist people, females or males, the objects of their derisive humor, the jokes that some people find to be side splitters that are of that order, some of us find to be rather sick and altogether humorless. Some of the stories we tell are, are revelatory about character. A friend of mine who is Russian and in whose home I stay when I'm in Moscow, he says, uh, do, you, do you know what a Frenchman says if his neighbor gets a cow? I said, no, I don't. He says, hmm, I must get a cow. He says, but what does an American say if his neighbor gets a cow? I said, I don't know. He said, oh, I must get me two cows. He says, you know what a Russian says if his neighbor gets a cow? I said, I don't know, Volodya, what? I'm going to kill my neighbor's cow. I said, Volodya, that's a joke. I, I can't bring myself to laugh. He says, well, it's a joke that's told in our culture, but it tells a lot about the way we've come to live 
under a system where everyone had to be equal and anyone's possession of anything made him an object of hatred. So humor comes in all varieties, from the innocent to the revealing to the stereotypical and prejudicial and hateful. But laughter sometimes has a stimulus that has nothing to do with any of those things. Take Sarah's laughter. Poor Sarah. For all the wonderful things about her character, her fidelity to Father Abraham, her tolerance of, of his errors in relation to her and her handmaid and other situations, most of us remember her for this episode of her laughter. The Lord appears to her husband Abraham, and it was the Lord who appeared, a theophany. It wasn't simply a vision. It wasn't simply an audible word from God. It appears that this was legitimately one of those rare episodes in advance of the incarnation that would occur in Jesus of a theophany, a manifestation of God in some visible fleshly form. Three men appear. The text then says, and the Lord said, and Abraham stood before the Lord, before Yahweh. The and the angels, they go on to Sodom in connection with another story you'd know. In that appearance, there is the renewing, there is the expansion, there is the deepening of a promise that has already been made to Abraham that he would become the father of, of a great nation and that through his seed all mankind would be blessed. And you know the preliminaries to the story of how with regard to the promise and Abraham's trying to run ahead of God, there was this, you know, we think in medical ethics we're dealing with new issues all the time. We think surrogate motherhood is a new issue. It really isn't. It's right back there in Genesis. Doing something that really was not terribly unique within his own time and culture, Abraham thought perhaps the answer, the resolution the working out of this promise from God is that, that not from Sarah's own body, but from her handmaid, God, Abraham. You'll be called the father of the faithful, but right now you're, you're running ahead of God. God's his own interpreter. He'll make it plain. And now so much more time has passed and Abraham and Sarah are now well past the age of childbearing and, and the dream has essentially gone out of both of their hearts that, that this will ever happen. What, what will be the fulfillment of the promise were we mistaken in thinking there was a promise? The Lord appears. Abraham. Within the year... I'll make good on this promise. Sarah overheard and she laughed to herself at the thought that she could bear a child in her old age. And when confronted about her laughter, she lied. She said, oh, I, I didn't laugh. But now before we're too hard on Sarah, have you forgotten that back in the previous chapter, chapter 17, verse 17, that in a situation not here of theophany, but here just the promise being made by the voice of God, Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of ninety? Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. Now we remember Sarah's laughter, but some of, us have, some of us have forgotten that Abraham's response at this point of being 100 years old, his response was the very same. He laughed, she laughed. It's the laughter of unbelief. 
It's the laughter of incredulity. It's the snickering of skepticism. Contrary to one's first blush and tone, it doesn't betray hardness of heart. It does not betray certainly rebellion against God. It more often signifies that one has just, has just heard something that's so good it can't be true. The news here is better than I can believe and the response is, I think the right adjective is nervous laughter. Think how you'd react if somebody called you and said, uh, Dick, you've won the Publishers Clearinghouse Sweepstakes. Yeah. <laughs> That's just about the way it would come through. Dick would know, ah, somebody is pulling my leg. All right, yeah, and I'm going to be elected president in a couple of weeks on the Demopublican ticket, too. <laughs> That's the laughter of, of, of incredulity. It's the laughter of, come on. You just couldn't believe that something so fabulous had happened to you. Abraham and Sarah both laughed. They just couldn't believe that what they'd wanted for decades was finally going to happen. And, and tonight, in deciding what to do with this text about the laughter of Sarah, I decided simply to focus precisely on this issue of faith. I think that really is the issue in this text. A trustworthy and faithful God has made promises to us that are so good that many of us live under the cloud of unbelief. The promises are so good we can't bring ourselves to live in the confidence they are intended to generate. We live in faithless. The power of faith is not in us to have it. It is in the God in whom the faith is placed. A strong faith in a false God is an empty faith, a weak faith even in the strong and holy God of Scripture who's revealed himself in Jesus Christ is a powerful faith. And some of you have strength and power at your disposal that you've not yet come to understand or revel in, tap into, draw from to be what God is calling you to be and to take the opportunities that he's putting before you. Let's take the matter of forgiveness first up because I think that may be the most important of all. That God has announced to some of you that you are forgiven people against what you know about yourself and against that deep, dark secret in your life, against that shameful episode out of your past. That to you is something too good for you to believe and you are still beating yourself, you are still whipping yourself, you are still shackling yourself because you cannot believe that the message is quite so good as it would first sound. Evelyn was a Christian lady who'd been unfaithful to her husband of nine years. She'd gotten pregnant and she'd had an abortion. Four months later, she's in my office and she's telling me about it. I am the first person that she has trusted to reveal this to and she is confessing it and she's wanting some guidance. We talked for over an hour. I'm convinced because I know them. Had for several years. I'm convinced that she loved her husband. She was not a wicked woman. She'd just been vulnerable at a time when she and her husband had been having some problems and the other man came along and paid her attention, to use Evelyn's own words, at just the wrong time. And what in normal circumstances would not have been a temptation was in fact temptation and Satan exploited that weakness and they had a three-week affair and she discovered she was pregnant and she did the only thing her panicked soul could think of to hide her sin and now she was paying a double debt to guilt for both the affair and now for that abortion at the end of that session Evelyn and I had together we prayed she began the prayer and through tears and sobbing she asked to be forgiven and when she could speak no more I took over the prayer and I began to pray for God to heal her soul and strengthen her marriage and when we opened our eyes and looked at each other I looked as deeply in the hole and I said Evelyn you're forgiven and do you know what her reaction was honest engine she laughed not a mean mocking laugh mind you not a, ha, 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 ha. Okay, I'll go do it again. 
but a shy, doubting land. A nervous, timid, frightened laugh. A laugh that probably in tone and timber was akin to Sarah's. It said that she hadn't been whipped, she hadn't been exposed to ridicule, she hadn't had any stones thrown at her. This was going to be too easy. It said, that, it said that she thought she hadn't suffered yet enough for what she'd done. You know, a lot of us are trained to think till we've had our spanking, it hasn't been made right. Just one talk and a prayer. So we talked a while longer about the price of the redemption. Christ had given her. Forgiveness isn't easy, people. We are saved by grace if we are saved at all. And grace is the unmerited free favor of God bestowed on Christ. While it's free, though, it is not cheap. He paid a debt. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing Amazing Grace, a brand new song. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. You see, in forgiveness, God assumes our debt and pays our penalty at Calvary. And now our genuine sorrow over our personal sins gives us access into pardon. And when we first come to God through Christ in that initial repentance and baptism, it's not just that we are washed then of the past. We are initiated into a relationship with the blood of Christ that goes simultaneously to the past and the future in all of our lives. And we live in forgiveness so long as we maintain an attitude of penitence and confession about our sin. And even when we commit the kind of sin that Evelyn had, and lived in alienation from God when finally our heart breaks over it and we can stand the guilt of it no more and we come back and we say, God, the response of God is, as in the story of the prodigal son, to jump off the porch and come running to you, not lock the door and say, I'm going to make you stand out in the heat and sweat a while. People, forgiveness is real. And after 15 or 20 minutes of talking about the cross and the price that God had paid so Evelyn could be redeemed and forgiven, forgiven Evelyn sobbed again, and this time it was the sobbing of relief. She understood and she believed now that she was forgiven. And years after the fact, she's living joyously in the Lord and with her husband. They are faithful and active in the church. They have a child born since that terrible episode that could have destroyed them if Satan had used it to his, in, his intent and purpose. But for her, the idea of she had done, it was just too good. And she laughed. Prospect of change real, meaningful change in somebody's life is another thing that some of us have difficulty accepting. You likely remember the response of the Christians in Jerusalem when Saul of Tarsus returned there after his conversion. Here's what Dr. Luke tells us, Acts 9, 26, they were all disciples. In effect, they laughed off the possibility that anybody they'd known to be the way Saul had been could so drastically change from that to what he was claiming now to be. We still do the same thing occasionally. You ever known of anybody being put on probation in a church? Now we will affirm to him that God has forgiven you of what you've done and then, and if for 12 to 18 months you keep your nose clean, boy, we might let you serve communion or lead prayer again, closing prayer, not, not the main prayer. Or, dear lady, we might let you teach Bible class again someday. We think that somebody either can't or hasn't changed, so we refuse to allow them to exhibit the change. At other times, we explore every sort of option for effecting change in situations without looking to the Lord to be the principal agent of change. Counselors and programs and books can assist with change, and I'm not minimizing the role those may play, but genuine lasting change in human character comes with the Spirit of God, and you'd better look there if you want real healing to occur. 
More often than despairing of change in others, however, is the anguish of heart one feels over his or her own perceived inability to change, to be victorious over a temptation or to ride out and overcome a grief or a sorrow or a loss, to break a crippling addiction. At the age of 63, Arnold's a friend of mine, a member of the Woodmont Hills Church, who'd been an alcoholic all of his life. I didn't know it. I'd known him for several years, five, six, seven years at that point. He'd hidden it from me. He'd pretty well hidden it from everybody. He'd functioned. He'd kept his job, and he'd hidden his slavery from everybody but a handful of people, and, and they'd all covered for him and lied for him and protected him from the consequences of his drinking. But, but now that at age 62 he'd retired, he was drinking more than ever, and he was killing himself. And one Sunday morning, his wife came in the church building for the early service, and I was sort of running down the hall lest I be late getting in for the start of the service, and I spoke to her, but I saw big old tears in her eyes. And I decided they could start the service without me. It was more important right now to find out what was going on here. And I met her at the top step and sort of pulled her up against the wall and just leaned there a minute, and I said, something hurts this morning, can we talk about it? And she told me about what was going on at home, and she said, I can't take it anymore. I'm going to have to leave him. Been married over 40 years. But the final straw. I said, we've got to do some serious talk. Met with her Tuesday of that week. Her children... We talked, they filled me in on the background of it. I said, I don't know if you know the word intervention or not, but I said, before we wash our hands, I think we need to try one. And I coached them a little bit, and we got in the room and sort of startled Arnold that I'm... I, the, the name Arnold is not his real name, if you haven't picked up on that. The story is true, but I'm, I'm changing the name. Mid-afternoon, his wife's home, his kids are home, and now then I drive in, he sort of smells a rat, and if you get close enough, you smell it on his breath too. We get in the living room and we start talking, and first one and then another family member confronts him with what's going on, the reality that he's denying and the problem that he won't face up to. And I finally get involved in it and talk about resources available and help that he can get. And those of us outside his family who love him, his spiritual family who will stand with him. And I'm seated within three feet of him and I'm looking him right in the eye and I said, Arnold, by the power of God, you can change. And you know what he did? Honest engine. He laughed. And if you'd been in two rooms away in the house, you'd have heard it. It was almost a mocking laugh. It was a derisive laugh that said, I have tried. I've summoned up all the willpower, his word, all the gumption that I have. I've tried, I've tried, I can't. And he began to sob. And I spoke to him of the assurance of what some of us were willing to do to be directly involved in his life and his care, and he admitted himself to a treatment center. He was there for 28 days. He not only has stayed dry for the last five and a half years, but he has become a counselor at that very clinic where he was an inpatient for 28 days. He's become a resource to me. I refer people to him who've been drunks a long time and who think it's hopeless, you can't deal with it. There's no power, not even God's, that can break the stranglehold of this slavery on me. One of the neatest letters that I have in written a year after he got out of treatment. And he talks. 
He talks about closeness to his family that he hasn't experienced since the early days of their life together. He talks about a granddaughter who is no longer reluctant to come up to him and kiss him when she comes over to visit. She couldn't stand coming over to granddaddy's because when she got close enough to kiss him, the smell of the alcohol that was constant on him just made her sick. We laugh, but the Spirit of God is in the business of changing lives, has been from the first century until now, and your life is open to it. He'll do it for you too. Or maybe in your life it's a call to accomplish that you've sort of sniggered at and laughed off. Moses had been in the desert 40 years, a fugitive from Egyptian justice, a man who, like Abraham, was going to run ahead of God 40 years ago. He's going to deliver his people. And Moses, the failed deliverer, the fugitive from justice, is called of God to be the deliverer. And the response Moses made probably included some laughter. Read his words with laughter in your voice and you know the inflection represents his feelings. Exodus 3, verse 11. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? So God argued with Moses and he answered his quibbles and misgivings about dealing with the ruler of Egypt and he promised the presence of miraculous signs to demonstrate that, that he really had been sent from Yahweh. And he sent his brother Aaron along with him to handle some of the public speaking chores. And he said, I'll help both of you speak and I'll teach you what to do. People are still reluctant to accept the calls of God into their lives. Sometimes it's young people. They feel a stirring of call from God to go to a mission field. They hear a stirring of a call from God to, to commit their lives to some form of full-time Christian service. Whether from false modesty or true fear, they depreciate their ability to cope with the challenge, to deal with the situation, and they sell themselves short, and they forget that the power sufficient to the task will be supplied by the one who calls to the task. The call doesn't have to be monumental to be from God. You don't have to see a burning bush or have the fate of the whole world in your hands. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, 18, but in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. You worry that you don't have the gift, the ability somebody else had, and that if you had that gift or that calling, you, you do that, but not this little thing. Hey, God has put every part where he wants it to be. Your present challenge, whatever it is, is appropriate to your faith and to your growth today, you accept it and trust God to bring it to a conclusion. And he may call you to something else, something greater, but today be faithful to this call and this challenge. Let me close by telling you, I think every Olympics has come to have its, its defining event, defining personality. I think it was 74, it was that impish little smile of the Russian gymnast, Olga Corbett. A few years later, it was the American Mary Lou Retton. But in this latest Olympic Games this summer, July and August in Barcelona, surely it was Derek Redden. Don't know if you know the story, don't know if you saw it or saw it on the news clips. Derek Redman holds the records, uh, holds the record in the 400 meter run in his home country of Great Britain. And he was in Barcelona representing his country and he'd made it to the semifinals. And he's in the blocks and he's ready to run. He's waiting for the starter's gun, every muscle, every nerve taut and the gun fires. And he begins to run and he's with the leaders and he rounds that curve and he said, I heard it pop. And he went down on the track as if he'd been shot. What he thought was a busted hamstring turned out to be a severely pulled hamstring, but he was down. He was out of the race. The rest of them left him. 
and he was on his knees as if in prayer. He later said, I wasn't about to be carried off on a stretcher. I came there to represent my country and to finish that race, and so he struggled to get back up on his feet and stay in his lane and with that right leg line. And he was still about 100 meters from the finish line, and somebody jumped out of the stands onto the track with it, pushed a security guard back who tried to stop him. And he went down, and he got next to him, and he started talking to him. It was Derek's dad. And he walks along beside him for a few steps and he's talking to him and, and he's encouraging him. And Derek stops and just buries his head into his dad's shoulder and he sobs and, and, and then he, he raises his head up and he points to the finish line and his dad, his dad takes his arm and he locks that boy's arm around his neck and he begins walking with him and here he is, the dad, the fat, the old dad, carrying the taut, trim athlete, pulling him, really pulling him. And now then, in the stands, the crowd that earlier had applauded American Steve Lewis when he'd finished the race in 44.5 seconds to win it, they are now applauding more loudly for Derek Redmond. The clock's already been turned off, and his race will go down in the books officially as abandoned, but they are now clapping rhythmically with every step, every hop that he makes, and the crowd, everyone now on their feet together, a father with his son's arm locked around his neck, helping him, coaxing him, and he gets right to the finish line, and he releases him and lets him cross the finish line in one hop on his own. You think that boy thinks he crossed that line in his strength? Listen to me, people. Laugh if you will the nervous laughter of unbelief at the notion of being forgiven for what's in your past. Laugh if you will. The mocking laughter that says, I just don't believe I can change. I've tried too many times and failed. Laugh if you will. The mocking laughter with regard to some call God is making on your life. Laugh if you will, but in your laughter, hear God respond and say, I heard that like he did to Sarah. I heard that. But he doesn't respond. He doesn't point that out to, to shame you, to rebuke you, but to say, I heard that and it isn't true because I'm down out of the stands now. I'm out here on the track with you now. I've entered into your pain now. Come on, lock your arm around me. It'll be by my strength we'll get through this. You won't have to do this on your own. I'll carry it. That's what the incarnation is, people. It's God coming down the back stairs of heaven with a baby in his arms. It's God coming in the flesh to be with us, to identify in our flesh and blood with our weakness and our humanity, to say we are not alone in this. Believe, trust, have faith. Forgiveness is real. Change is possible. Service productive, faithful service can happen out of your niche in the world. God will be glorified because it's by His power, it's by His strength, and when you cross the finish line, all the glory will be God's. We'd all like to think we're on a dream team, speaking of Olympics, right? I could have been on that team and we'd have brought home the gold. Magic and Michael and Larry and Ruble. <laughs> hey, I'm no dream team player in basketball or spiritual things. Church, we're not a dream team. With our division, with our pettiness, with our lack of faith and lack of vision, we are more like Freddy's nightmare than we are God's dream team. But I'm crossing the finish line. I'm saved. I'm going to have, not because I'm good, not because I preach sermons, not because I give money, pray prayers, go to church. I'm saved because God has come down out of the stands and he has locked my weak, 
arm around his strong neck. He's letting me lean on his everlasting arms and he's bearing me through. I do lots of things out of gratitude to him for what he has given and is doing. Amen. Sounds very much like the biblical text, doesn't it? Doesn't it sound just exactly like Hebrews 12, 1? Let's, knowing that we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let's throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let's run with perseverance the race God set before us. Let's run it in faith, not unbelief. The laughter that comes of a healthy sense of humor is a good thing. Of this sort of laughter, the Bible says, a cheery heart is like good medicine, Proverbs 17, 22. It keeps us from taking life in general and ourselves in particular too seriously. So the next time you have a good laugh, thank God for the opportunity, but try not to laugh at the wrong time. Try to resist the laugh of incredulity to forgive and change and work through you. Don't give way to unbelief and don't mock God's mercy. Our God has a history of doing unheard of things. Instead of laughing, then trust because it's God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. After all, is anything too hard? That was his response to Sarah's laughter. People, listen to me. Whatever your pain and anguish may be, Nothing is too hard for the Lord, not even your case. So small and weak will produce the great result because it's properly placed in Him. Let's close with a song. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord.